Um, thank you, Judy, for that warm introduction, and thank you to all of you guys for coming here. Um, something clicked, actually, moments ago, uh, while I was listening to the, the beautiful poems that were just being read. Um, and also, it just reminded me again, when you were talking about... Um, Hello. There. Uh-oh. Okay, so... Um, yeah, and I just re remembered that actually I missed an appointment earlier today. So I don't know if any of you folks here are, I think some of you are associated with Kairos. I think I've seen Yay! some Kairos people. Yeah. So I just, I just have to extend apologies. Um, moments ago, I just realized that I missed uh, one of the speaking engagements I was supposed to be at this morning. Well, I was at that meeting with you, Mark. I don't know where you went, but... Anyway, uh, I just wanted to send uh, apologies up front and say my apologies. So, um, what's up everybody? My name is Michael Redhead Champagne. Happy and excited to be hanging out here. Um, Judy asked me to come here and I owe Judy, so gotta yeah. come and, gotta come and, and do, do what she asks, right? So, and actually, I wanted to start off by explaining the reason why I owe Judy. Um, you may or may not know, uh, once upon a time, Judy was a member of parliament. Um, she was actually our member of parliament. And when I was a baby, uh, uh, true story, true story. When I was a baby, I was like not even a year old. Um, I was taken, uh, I was in the care of CFS. I was put into a foster family with these interesting folks called the Champagnes. And uh, Judy was campaigning. She was campaigning to be elected on Alfred, Alfred Street, Alfred and Salter to be exact. And apparently, and I only know this story because my adopted family still tells it to this day, as a baby, Judy held me yeah. when I was a little yeah. baby. And it's funny now that I actually get to hang out with her like as like a real live adult. Um, so I just think that's really cool. But that's actually not the story that I meant to tell. Once upon a time in 2010, there was a municipal election going on. Um, prior to things really heating up, uh, Judy invited myself and another young man by the name of Rocky King to her kitchen. And uh, why did she invite us to her kitchen? Well, we were talking about building political capacity, um, uh, political literacy, educating people, especially young people, about getting involved in the political process. Because, I mean, how do we complain and shake our fist at Stephen Harper if we don't understand the system that he's a part of? And so Judy actually was there at the very beginning, a key architect of something that is now known as the Aboriginal Youth Opportunities Politics Initiative. Politics spelled with an X. Because, you know, you gotta have the, a little bit of attitude when you do your organizing. So we call it the politics. Um, and it was really great because since then we have been able to uh, develop that particular initiative into, um, into a really, really uh, unique uh, machine that attempts to engage and educate young people on political issues, on a spectrum of political issues. And just earlier today, while I was missing an appointment, we relaunched the Politics Brainstorm. And the Politics Brainstorm um, brought together for a casual discussion many, many young people and our helpers to discuss what we can do to educate and empower people so that they can participate in a meaningful way in politics. And a lot of that conversation had to do with education, but a lot of it also had to do with identity. Because how do people participate in something that they feel like doesn't represent them? And for a lot of young people that I know, they're hesitant to participate in politics. And so we're hoping with the help of individuals such as Judy, um, I also see Ross, Ross Eady. He's a, 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 a round of applause for Ross Eady, everyone. He's our city councilor. But it's because of these types of individuals in our community that are provi providing support to myself and other young leaders that we are able to do the work that we do. And we do this work, uh, Aboriginal Youth Opportunities, for those of you who don't know, many of us uh, are, uh, are known not as Aboriginal Youth Opportunities, many of us just know us as AO, which is a lot of fun to say, you guys should say it with me, say AO. Aw, oh, come on, you guys. It's Saturday night, let's get a little bit of flavor into this. Say, Ayo! Ayo! There we go. That's what I like to 
here. Yeah, so AO, Aboriginal Youth Opportunities, once upon a time in 2010 was simply an idea. But that is the danger of young people with a, a community supporting them. An idea can become pretty dangerous pretty quick. And Aboriginal Youth Opportunities has uh, blazed several trails in about a thousand different directions. I really have no idea how this happened. But it came because young people came together um, and were validated. And we were encouraged, actually, I wore this shirt today on purpose because of how Aboriginal Youth Opportunities started. I'm wearing a medicine wheel right now. So for those of you who are not familiar with the medicine wheel, you may recognize these particular colors. Now, the medicine wheel acknowledges, I, I, I like to think about it as um, a lens with which to view the world. It gives us an opportunity and an ability to look at things maybe in a little bit of a different way than we normally would have before. And the, the four different parts of the medicine wheel represent many different parts of our natural life. They represent the stages that we all go through, children, youth, adult, and elder, and it's that cycle. The medicine wheel also represents the four directions, north, east, south, west. The medicine wheel represents the four seasons, summer, spring, autumn, winter. There we go, I got the last one. Um, but most importantly, I think, the medicine wheel represents the four parts of ourselves and who we are. And it represents, in the east, on my shirt, that's the yellow part, it represents the spirit. That's a part of us that believes. And it doesn't matter what you believe in, you could believe in the tooth fairy, but what you believe in is your spirit. In the south, we have our body, and our body is a part of us that physically exists, right? So right now I'm looking at a bunch of bodies, but I don't see all of you. I only see the physical part of you, because I can't exactly see your beliefs, so I can't see your spirit, but it's probably somewhere in and around your body, I would guess. In the west, we have our heart and our emotions. And each one of us has an emotional self that we have to take care of. And in the north we have our mind, or the mental part of ourselves. And so collectively, the spirit, the mind, the body, and the heart provide a lens with which to look at one another and the world so that we can hopefully address things in a good way and in a meaningful way. And I share this because as somebody who is Cree, originally from Shamatawa, I'm disconnected from my community and I grew up in the north end. And learning and talking about the medicine wheel is a part of decolonization for all of us young people that are in the process of learning our teachings, learning our language, so that the things that were spoken about in that poem, Highway 6, do not continue to happen. Because you are not go I, I think about Aboriginal youth opportunities and the young people that have helped build this movement into what it is today. And we are all volunteers. None of us get paid for the work that we do but we are all passionate. And we take ownership over the issues in our community. And we can't really, we, because we're not an organization and because we don't got money, we can't really do the traditional way of organizing. So we can't like buy a program and then deliver a program. But what we can do is we can lead by example. And that is really where the power has come from, from Aboriginal Youth Opportunities. We've been taking the teachings that have been shared with us from our spiritual teachers and our elders, um, and we, we try to internalize that into the way that we organize. So it's not easy, but we are trying in 2013, this crazy techno technological, um, fast-paced, um, overwhelming world, to slow things down a little bit and look at one another, not only as bodies, but as spirits, as hearts, and as minds. And if we do that, it's our hope that we will be able to empower not only other young indigenous leaders, but our neighborhoods, and our communities, and our families, and you guys, and the people that aren't here. And you know, basically we're just trying to save the world. <laughs> no big deal. Um, but, Aboriginal Youth Opportunities um, is something that I never thought was going to be real. I remember when it was a, a crazy dream in my head, and, and, and three years later, we're still going strong, and I'm going to tell you only about one more of our, our initiatives before I finish, because I have an invitation for all of you. 
In November 2011, now many of you will remember 2011 as an interesting year for the north end of Winnipeg. Does anybody remember any significant things about the year 2011 and the north end of Winnipeg? Can anyone just think? Think back. Think back to 2011. What was happening in 2011 in the north end that could possibly be significant? A.O., you're not allowed to answer. Anyone? I don't know more. Actually came at the end of 2012, so no. Any other ideas? <laughs> What's happening in our neighborhood, in our community in 2011? Take Back the Night did happen in 2011, it's true. And actually it did happen, I believe it was at Turtle Island that year. Um, what I'm referring... Meet Me at the Bell Tower did be Thank you, Judy, yes. Meet Me at the Bell Tower did begin in 2011, but it's the reasons why Meet Me at the Bell Tower began that I'm referring to. In 2011, the violence, Ross, you, you said it. <laughs> and Ross was, Ross was dancing, apparently. Um, in 2011, we had a lot of violence um, in our community. You may or may not remember, Winnipeg earned the title that year of Murder Capital of Canada. The first and last homicides of 2011 happened on Selkirk Avenue. That's right where we live. That's our hood. For Aboriginal youth opportunities, this is where we, this is where we live. And when that happened, it was overwhelming. We were losing friends and we were having these really awesome family reunions at funeral homes. And really awesome family reunions in hospital emergency rooms. And it's a really messed up feeling and I'm confident you all can relate to see a bunch of people that you love and are important to you all together and you feel joy. But then when you remember why we're all together, someone's hurt, someone's passed away. So what do we do? How do we stop violence? And how do we take those good feelings and make sure that they, they're forever, not just sometimes? How do we do that? And that's where Meet Me at the Bell Tower came in. Um, Jenna Licious, who was up here just a little while ago, um, told me a story leading up to our first Meet Me at the Bell Tower about a time where on her last day of employment in that particular region, a group of kids shimmied up the bell tower and for the first time in their young lives, heard it ring. And that moment of empowerment stayed with me. And when we were talking about this violence, we thought, well, let's, let's have a march. Let's, we'll get people together, we'll go marching somewhere, and we'll like yell around and we'll say, you know, quit fighting and those types of things. Well, we had to ask ourselves the question, where are we going to march to? We, we could have marched to all the places in our community where all the violence was happening, because there certainly were many opportunities to go and, and remember those people who lost their lives and were victims of violence. But we're like, where are we going to go to? Let's go to the legislative building. That's where people march to when they're mad, right? Apparently. But we're like, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Why would we march to the legislative building if we're marching to keep our neighbors safe? Why would we leave our community with a message that is for our community? So, after Genelicious told us the story of the empowerment at the bell tower, that was it. That was the magic that we wanted. That's what we thought could save lives and prevent violence. And so, on Friday, November 18th, 2011, we even put it on Facebook, the first Meet Me at the Bell Tower rally was to happen. Now, five of us organized it, and most of us are actually here today. And before I go on to tell you uh, what else happened, I'm just going to embarrass the AO leadership team for a second. Can I get the AO leadership team just to stand up for a second? Grace, Jenna, Riel, Mark, stand up for a second. Um, I just want you guys to look around at these people. It's all their fault that I have anything to talk to you about. So we're trying to show up to the leadership team. I may be the storyteller and I may often be the public face, but I do not do anything alone. I do not do any of this work by myself and I have never once in the history of Aboriginal Youth Opportunities succeeded because Michael Champagne did something. 
That is simply not true. It is the work of the young people in our community that give me a story to tell. It is the work of a community united, like you, that give me a story to tell. And I know that I'm a storyteller. That's my job. That's my role in my community. But I'm telling the stories of hope and the stories of positivity. And that's what Meet Me at the Bell Tower is and continues to be. And even though we struggle ourselves, I hope it continues to be an opportunity for our community to come together and celebrate what is good about our community. Not the negative, not the bad, not the violence, the community. Because on Friday, November 18th, when we got people together for our very first rally, the five of us were all getting ready, and at five o'clock, a snowstorm hit Winnipeg. How shocking. <laughs> Minus 40 wins. It sucked. But, we were, we were contemplating, just before it began, it was going to start that Friday at 6 o'clock p.m., we were contemplating whether or not we should cancel it. Because we're like, it's cold, like there might only be five of us that show up, um, there's a freak storm happening, and who's going to want to go out to stop violence in the middle of all the violence? I mean, that's actually very unsafe. Well, we said, just, just go with it. Just go with it. And weren't we surprised? when our city councilor showed up, and when 40 other members of our community showed up and said, we're with these guys. What an interesting moment. Hold on, don't clap yet, because there's more awesome stuff to tell. Um, so, that was a good moment, when our community came together, and we marched around, and we, we talked about how the violence is affecting us, and how we want to create a community that's safer for all of our kids, and we're like, how do we do that? And the only solution we could come up with was our example. And maybe it's small, but it's something we can own. It's something we have control over. And we don't have control over all those systems and institutions that are, are making it possible for 600 of our relatives to go missing. But we have control over our own hands and our own action. And if we do nothing else, at least we can say to our classmates, our neighbors, our friends, our cousins, I'm not violent. I'm living a life that is violence-free, and I hope you do too. And so at the end of the rally, when we finished yelling around in the storm, oh, and I also should mention, uh, Ross Eady actually donated some t-shirts to us that first night as an incentive. So all 40 people, he must have known, magically, he brought 40 t-shirts. Magically, everyone got a t-shirt at that first round. And we asked ourselves the question, when do we get together again? Do we wait for another person to get hurt in our neighborhood? Or when does this happen again? And everyone said, next Friday, yeah, next Friday. So we did. And the next Friday, 100 people came. And those 100 people spoke in one voice. And that one voice said, next Friday! <laughs> so we did. And again, and again, and again. All the way through 2012, all the way through 2013. I have like bell ringing muscles like you wouldn't believe. Um, but something really cool happened because how do you know? How do you know if the things that you're doing can we get a round of applause for this little kid here? She's just way too cute. I just can't handle it. I just can't handle it. It's so cute. Okay, okay, sorry, distracted. Um, and we continued. And in 2012, the Winnipeg police began measuring the violent crime in Winnipeg. And as Meet Me at the Bell Tower, we were able to witness some amazing things in our community. One of the projects Aboriginal Youth Opportunities worked on with the City of Winnipeg, the Suffolk Avenue Biz, and North End Community Renewal Corporation were the first new banners on Suffolk Avenue in 19 years. Shortly after Meet Me at the Bell Tower began, those banners went up. 19 years. Many of the young people that worked on that project for their entire life looked up their street and saw skeletal remains of faded, shredded fabric. And that's supposed to represent our community? I don't think so. So we changed it. And we're going to keep changing it. 
and we are going to keep ringing our bell. And in 2012, the Winnipeg police actually started documenting the violent crime. Started actually documenting the violent crime in Winnipeg. So I don't know exactly why, but apparently they weren't documenting it before. But they said, hey, let's, in 2012, start tracking violent crime. So, 2013, they released a little bit of a report that said violent crime in Winnipeg over 2012 was reduced by over 3% in the city. So that's positive. They even broke down the numbers. They even broke down the numbers further for the North End community, a geographic area comprising about 60,000 individuals. And they said that the crime rate went, went down even more in the North End. It actually went down over 7% in the larger North End. But it gets better, and this is where I wanted you to save your clapping until, because they also did a measurement around Meet Me at the Bell Tower. And another accomplishment that we got to witness at Meet Me at the Bell Tower was very significant. It was the closing down of the Merchant's Hotel, which is only one block away. And so, they did an additional measurement, thank you please for doing all this awesome measuring, to about two blocks from where the bell tower is to the north, east, south, and west. And the violent crime reduction in that area around where we march every Friday saw an 18% reduction in violent crime. 18%. And this all came from listening to our young people and their ideas and their obnoxiousness. We have a megaphone, we ring a bell, we march around with big groups of people, but we do it with love and we do it with positivity. And we take the teachings that have been shared with us and try to implement that into our actions and our words and our projects. And we try to make sure that all of our projects and initiatives in our community have the parts of this medicine wheel. Have a heart, a mind, a spirit, in addition to their body. So we're keeping it up. We're continuing to grow. And I'm proud to say that on November 15, 2013, you are all invited to the Meet Me at the Bell Tower two-year anniversary. So you are all invited, November 15. Please come, uh, bring, bring a friend, bring your family down. We always have kids. But there are some rules. If you're gonna come to meet me at the bell tower, you gotta help. Because the reality is, well, like I said, we don't got no money. <laughs> so, how we ask people to help, and it's the same thing uh, for all of you as I would ask this little one here, help where you can. And so, we have, if you have an announcement, come and share this announcement of an upcoming opportunity. If you have a story to share, please come and share that story with us. If you have some extra random stuff lying around your house, we give away prizes every week, but the prizes come from the group. So if you got some cool stuff lying around, bring it down, we'll give it away as a prize. And I bet you there's gonna be someone at that bell tower who walks away emotionally impacted because they got something random that they didn't think that they would get, but it's special. So you guys can help us and you can join the movement and Oh, I forgot to mention probably the most important thing. When you come down to the bell tower and if you're there for your first time, you get first dibs at ringing the bell. <laughs> so, Aboriginal Youth Opportunities, um, the north end of Winnipeg is on the upswing. Regardless of what the media may say, I know from personal experience and what I can see on the ground that our young people are waking up. Our community is waking up. And even though demographically, we do have quite a young community, we got this if we work together and if we continue to make that positive noise. So please join me, join the movement. You are all capable. And most importantly, you are all welcome. So come on back. Thank you.